Chapter 6 Nitya Dharma Race and Caste Devidas Vidyaratna was a teacher, and for a long time he had been firmly convinced that the Brahmanas were foremost among all Varnas. He believed that no one except Brahmanas are fit to obtain the highest goal of life, and that unless he takes birth in a Brahmana family, the jiva cannot attain mukti. He also believed that birth in such a family is the sole cause of developing the characteristic nature of a Brahmana. When he heard the discussions between the Vaishnavas and the descendant of Chankazi, he became completely dissatisfied. He could not penetrate the statements of Kazi Sahib at all, for they were full of deep fundamental truths. Perturbed at heart, Devidas Vidyaratna began to think, Indeed, the Muslim race is a strange phenomena, and one cannot make any sense of what they say. Of course, Father has studied Farsi and Arabic, and he has been studying religion for a long time, but why does he give so much respect to the Muslims? A Hindu is obliged to take a bath in order to purify himself, if he as much as touches a Muslim. So what could Paramahamsa Babaji Maharaj have been thinking when he invited such a person to be seated in the assembly, and offered him so much respect? That very night, Devidas said, Shambhu, I cannot remain silent in this matter. I shall ignite a blazing fire of logical debate and burn this heretical view to ashes. It was here in Navadweep that stalwart scholars like Sava Boma and Siromani discussed the Nyaya Shastra and Raghunandan churned the twenty-eight truths of the Smriti Shastra. How is it that the Hindus and Muslims are now intermingling in this very same Navadweep? Perhaps the teachers of Navadweep have not gotten wind of this news yet. Vidyaratna applied himself wholeheartedly to his task for a couple of days. At daybreak, a light drizzle had fallen. By mid-morning, oppressed by the clouds, the sun had not been able to cast a single glance upon the earth. Devi and Shambhu finished a meal of kitchari before ten o'clock and got ready, sensing that the appropriate moment was upon them. In Sri Godruma, the Vaishnavas had been delayed in their Madukari. However, almost all of them had honoured Prasad, and were sitting in a large kutia to one side of the Madhavi Malati Bower. Paramahamsa Babaji, Vaishnav Das, Pandit Ananta Das from the village of Nishingapali, Lahiri Mahashai and Yadava Das from Kulia started chanting Harinam on their Tulsi Mala, absorbed in Paramananda. At that time, the famous Pandit, Krishna Chudamani arrived, together with Vidyaratna Mahashai, Chatubuja Padaratna from Samudgra, Chintamani Nayaratna from Kashi, and Kalidas Vachaspati from Puravastali. The Vaishnavas offered great respect to the learned Brahmanas and had them seated. Paramahamsa Babaji said, It is said that an overcast day is inauspicious, but this day has become most auspicious for us. Today the Brahmana pandits of the Dham have purified our kutia with the dust of their feet. Vaishnavas naturally consider themselves more insignificant than grass, so they all offered pranam, saying, Vipra Charanabhya Namaha, obeisances unto the feet of the Brahmanas. The Brahmana pandits, who considered themselves to be respectable scholars, responded by offering blessings to the Vaishnavas and then sat down. The Brahmanas, whom Vidyaratna had prepared for a debate, offered pranam to Lahiri Mahashai because he was senior to all of them. Lahiri Mahashai, who was by now conversant with the confidential truths of the Shastras, immediately returned pranams to the pandits. Of all the pandits, Krishna Chudamani was the most eloquent. He had debated the meaning of the Shastra with many other pandits in Kashi, Mithila, and numerous other places and had defeated all of his opponents. He was short with a lustrous dark complexion and a grave countenance, and his eyes shone like a pair of stars. Now he began the discussion with the Vaishnavas. Chudamani said, Today we have come to take darshan of the Vaishnavas. Although we do not support all your conduct, we very much admire your exclusive devotion. Sri Bhagavan himself states in Bhagavad Gita 9.30, Apichet sudaracharo, budget mam ananyabak, sadur eva samantavya, 
samyagvyava sitohisa. Even if one is an abominable sinner, if he worships me with exclusive devotion, he is to be considered a sadhu, for his intelligence is firmly situated in the proper determination. This statement of the Bhagavad Gita is our evidence, and it is because of this conclusion that we have come to take darshan of the sadhus today. But we have one complaint. Why do you associate with Muslims on the pretext of bhakti? We wish to discuss this matter with you. Whoever amongst you is most expert in debate should step forward. The Vaishnavas were distressed by Krishna Chudamani's words, and Paramahamsa Babaji said very humbly, We are fools. What do we know of debate? We simply act in accordance with the behavior shown by the previous Mahajans. You are all scholars, so you may recite the instructions of the Shastra, and we will listen in silence. Chudamani said, How can you act according to such a statement? You are under the auspices of Hindu society, and if you perpetrate practices and teachings that are opposed to the Shastra, the world will come to ruin. We will practice and preach against Shastra, and at the same time claim that we are on the path of the Mahajans? What kind of talk is this? Who is a Mahajan? One can be truly known as a Mahajan only if his behavior and teachings are in accordance with Shastra. How can there be any benefit for the world if we simply label anyone we like a Mahajan, and then quote the saying, Mahajana Yena Gata Sapanta, one should follow the path of the Mahajans. Chudamani's words became intolerable for the Vaishnavas, so they left and consulted with one another in a separate kutia. They concluded that, since the Mahajans were being accused of being at fault, it was imperative that they refute the charges, as long as it was in their power to do so. Paramahamsa Babaji chose not to participate in the debate. Pandit Anantadas Babaji was a scholar of the Nyaya Shastra, but everyone requested Sri Vaishnav Das Babaji to conduct the debate. The Vaishnavas could immediately understand that Devidas Vidyaratna had instigated this turmoil. Lahiri Mahashai was also present, and he added, Devi is extremely proud. His mind became disturbed on the day he witnessed our behavior with Kazi Sahib, and that is why he has now brought all these Brahmana Pandits here. Vaishnava Das took the dust of Paramahamsa Babaji's feet on his head and said, I shall bear the order of the Vaishnavas upon my head. Today the knowledge that I have imbibed must certainly be successful. By this time the sky was clear. A broad sitting place was spread out under the Malati Madhavi grove, and the Brahmana Pandits sat on one side and the Vaishnavas on the other. All the Brahmanas and Pandits of Sri Godrum and Madhyadweep had been called there and many neighboring students and scholarly brahmanas also joined the assembly. So it was by no means a small gathering. About a hundred brahmana pandits were seated on one side, and about two hundred Vaishnavas on the other. Vaishnava Das Babaji, calm and composed, sat at the head of the assembly by the request of the Vaishnavas. Just then an astonishing incident occurred. A cluster of malati flowers fell on Vaishnava Das's head from the vines above, this enlivened the Vaishnavas, inspiring them to utter the name of Hari loudly. This is to be understood as the mercy of Sriman Mahaprabhu, they declared. On the other side, Krishna Chudamani grimaced and said, You may think that, but flowers will not do. The tree shall be known by its fruit. Dismissing the matter, Vaishnav Das began, This meeting that is taking place in Navadweep today resembles the assemblies which take place in Varanasi, and this is a cause of great happiness for me. Although I am a resident of Bengal, I spent many years studying and lecturing in Varanasi and other places, so I am not so used to speaking in Bengali. I would like the questions and answers in today's assembly to be in Sanskrit. Chudamani had studied the Shastra diligently, but he could not speak Sanskrit fluently apart from some shlokas that he had committed to memory. He was somewhat dismayed by Vaishnav Das's proposal, and said, Why, we are meeting in Bengal, so it is best to speak in Bengali. I cannot speak Sanskrit like the pundits of the western provinces. Everyone could understand, by observing their respective moods, 
that Chudamani was becoming fearful of debating with Vaishnav Das. They all requested Vaishnav Das to speak in Bengali, and he agreed. Chudamani raised the first objection by asking, Is Jati, caste, Nitya, invariable? Are the Hindus and Muslims not different castes? Do the Hindus not become fallen by associating with Muslims? Vaishnava Das replied, According to the Nyaya Shastra, Jati, a term that refers to birth, is invariable. However, the Jati Bade distinction between caste mentioned there does not refer to the difference of caste among human beings born in different countries. This term refers to the difference of species, such as that which is found between cows, goats and human beings. Chudamani said, Yes, what you say is quite true, but does that mean there's no Jati Bed, caste distinction, between Hindus and Muslims? Vaishnav Das said, Yes, there is a distinction between the castes, but that type of Jati is not eternal. Human beings have only one Jati, which in this case means species. Within the human species, many different jatis, castes, have been invented based on the differences of language, country, style of dress and skin color. Chudamani Is there no difference in terms of birth? Or does the difference between Hindus and Muslims consist of nothing more than the difference in clothing and other such things? Vaishnav Das Jivas are born into higher or lower varnas, or castes according to their previous karma, and in congruity with their varnas, they are eligible for different types of work. Brahmanas, Kshatriyas, Vaishyas and Sudras are the four varnas. All others are antyaja, which means that they are low-born and outside the caste system. Chudamani, are the Muslims not outcast? Vaishnav Das Yes, According to the Shastra, they are outside the jurisdiction of the four Varnas, Antyaja. Chudamani. Then how can Muslims be Vaishnavas, and how can respectable Vaishnavas associate with them? Vaishnavdas. Vaishnavas are those who have pure bhakti, and all human beings are candidates for Vaishnava Dharma. Muslims are not eligible to perform the duties prescribed for the different Varnas in the Varnashram system, because their birth disqualifies them. However, they have every right to participate in the practices of bhakti. One can never say that he knows the actual purport of the Shastras until he has minutely examined the subtle differences between Karmakanda, Gyankanda and Bhakti Kanda. Chudamani Very well. When one performs one's prescribed karma, the heart is gradually purified so that one becomes eligible for Gyan. Amongst the Gyanis, some are near Beda Brahmavadis, whose ideal is to merge into the undifferentiated, impersonal Brahman, while others are Vaishnavas, who accept the personal form of Bhagavan possessing transcendental attributes, Savisheshvad. According to this progression, one cannot become a Vaishnava without first completing one's eligibility for karma. Muslims are not eligible even to perform the prescribed karma within the Varna system because they are outcasts, so how can they become eligible for bhakti? Vaishnav Das Outcast human beings have every right to practice bhakti. All the Shastras accept this, and Sri Hari himself has stated in Srimad Bhagavad Gita 9.32 Mam hi partha vyapa shritya ye pishyu papayonaya Striyo Vaishyas Tata Sudras, Te Piyanti Param Gatim. O son of Prita, women, Vaishyas, Shudras, and low-born people who have taken birth in sinful families can attain the supreme destination by taking shelter of me. Here the word Ashritya, taking shelter, refers to Bhakti. This is corroborated in the Skanda Purana. Brahmana Chatriyo Vaishya, Shudro va yadi vetaraha, Vishnu bhakti sama yukto, Gyeo sarva tamas chasa. Kashi Kanda, 2163, quoted in Hari Bhakti Vilas, 10, 106. Whether one is a Brahmana, Chatriya, Vaishya, Sudra, or an outcast, 
If he has taken shelter of Vishnu Bhakti, he is considered to be superior to all. It is said in the Naradiya Purana, Svapacho pi mahi pala, Vishnu bhakto dvijadika, Vishnu bhakti vihi no yo, yatis cha svapachadika. Quoted in Hari Bhakti Vilas, 1087. O king, a devotee of Sri Vishnu is better than a Brahmana, even if he is born in a family of dog eaters, whereas a sannyasi, who is devoid of Vishnu bhakti, is even more wretched than a chandala. Chudamani. You may give many quotations from Shastra as evidence, but it is important to see what is the underlying principle in this consideration. How can the defect of degraded birth be removed? Can a defect relating to one's birth be removed without taking another birth? Vaishnavdas. The defect of a degraded birth is a result of parapta karma, previous activities that have begun to bear fruit in this life. And this Parabdha Karma can be destroyed by uttering the name of Sri Hari. The proof of this is stated in Srimad Bhagavatam 6.16.44 Yan Nama Sakrich Travanat Pukashopi Vimuchyate Samsarat Even a low-born dog-eater can be delivered from material existence simply by hearing your holy name once. It is also stated in Srimad Bhagavatam 6.2.46 Nata param karma nibanda krintanam mumukshatam tita pada nukirtanat nayat puna karma susajate mano rajas tamobyam kalilam tatonyata. Those who desire liberation from the bondage of material existence have no means of rooting out sin except by the chanting of the holy names of Sri Hari who sanctifies even the holy places by the mere touch of his lotus feet. The reason is that when one performs Nam Sankirtan, the mind does not become attached to karma again, whereas when one practices any other means of atonement, the mind is again contaminated by the material qualities of passion and ignorance, since the tendencies to commit sin have not been destroyed at the root. Again in Srimad Bhagavatam 3.33.7 it is stated, Aho bhattasva pachato gariyan yad jiva grevartate nama tobyam te pustapaste juhuvusasnu arya brahmanu chur nama granantiye te. Oh, what more can be said about the greatness of a person who chants the holy name of Sri Hari? A person whose tongue utters your holy names is superior to all, even if he has taken birth in a family of dog eaters. His brahminical status has already been established in his previous birth. Those fortunate jivas who chant Sri Hari Nam have already undergone austerities, performed fire sacrifices, bathed at the holy places, followed the rules of proper conduct, and thoroughly studied the Vedas. Chudamani. Then why is it that a chandala who chants Hari Nam is barred from performing yagyas and other brahminical activities? Vaishnavdas. One must take birth in a Brahmana family to perform yagyas and other such activities, and even one who is born in a Brahmana family must be purified by the ceremony of investiture with the sacred thread before he is eligible to perform the duties of a Brahmana. Similarly, a Chandala may become purified by taking up Harinam, but he is still not eligible to perform yagyas until he acquires seminal birth in a Brahmana family. However, he can perform the angas of bhakti, which are infinitely greater than yagyas. Chudamani, what kind of conclusion is that? How can a person who is disqualified from an ordinary privilege be qualified for something that is much higher? Is there any conclusive evidence for this? Vaishnavdas, there are two types of human activity, material activities that relate to practical existence, vyavaharik, and spiritual activities, that relate to the ultimate truth, param -attik. A person may have attained spiritual qualification, but that does not necessarily qualify him for particular material activities. For example, one who is a Muslim by birth may have acquired the nature and all the qualities of a Brahmana, so that he is a Brahmana from the spiritual point of view, but he still remains ineligible for certain material activities, such as marrying the daughter of a Brahmana. 
Chudamani. Why is that? What is wrong if he does so? Vaishnav Das. If one violates social customs, one is guilty of secular impropriety, and members of society who take pride in their social respectability do not condone such activities. That is why one should not perform them, even if he is spiritually qualified. Chudamani. Please tell me, what is the cause of eligibility for karma, and what is the cause of eligibility for bhakti? Vaishnav Das. The cause of eligibility for karma is one's nature, birth, and other such vyavaharic causes that make one suitable for a particular type of work. Tat Tat Karma Yoga Svabhav Janma. The source of eligibility for bhakti is Tatvik Sraddha, faith that is rooted in the Absolute Truth. Chudamani. Don't try to intimidate me with the language of Vedanta. Explain clearly what you mean by Tat Tat Karma Yoga Svabhav. Vaishnav Das. The qualities that are found in the nature of a Brahmana are Shama, control of the senses, Dhamma, control of the mind, Tapa, austerity, Shocha, purity, Santosh, satisfaction, Shama, forgiveness, Saralata, simplicity, Isha Bhakti, devotion to Bhagavan, Daya, mercy, and Satya, truthfulness. The natural qualities of a Chatriya are Teja, prowess, Bala, physical strength, Driti, resoluteness, Shorya, heroism, Titiksha, tolerance, Udharata, magnanimity, Udyama, perseverance, Dhirata, gravity, Brahmanyata, devotion to the Brahmins, and Aishwarya, opulence. The qualities that characterize the Vaishyas are Ashtikya, theism, Dan, charity, Nishta, faith, Adambikata, absence of pride, and Arta Trishna, eagerness to accumulate wealth. The natural qualities of a Shudra are Dvija Godeva Seva, service to the Brahmanas, cows and celestial deities, and Yata Lava Santosh, satisfaction with whatever is obtained. The qualities in the nature of an Antyaja, outcast, are Asocham, uncleanliness, Mitya, dishonesty, Chorya, thievery, Nashtikata, atheism, Vrita Kalaha, futile quarreling, Kam, lust, Kroda, anger, and Indriya Trishna, hankering to satisfy one's senses. The Shastras prescribe that one's Varna should be determined according to these different natures. The determination of Varna on the basis of birth alone is a recent practice. An individual's inclination for a specific type of work and his expertise in it are both related to these natures. A person's nature gives rise to his inclination and taste for particular activities, and it is this particular nature, Svabhav, that is known as the nature according to specific types of work, Tat Tat Karma Yoga Svabhav. In some cases, birth is the prominent factor in ascertaining a person's nature, and in other cases, association is the primary factor. Nature is formed by association, which begins from birth, so birth is certainly one cause that determines the development of nature. Indeed, nature develops from the moment of birth, but that does not mean that birth is the only cause of nature and eligibility for a particular type of work. It is a great mistake to think like this, for there are many other causes. Therefore the Shastras prescribe that one must study a person's nature when one assesses eligibility for work. Chudamani What is meant by Tattvik Shraddha, faith in the Absolute Truth? Vaishnav Das Tattvik Shraddha is pure-hearted faith in Bhagavan, which gives rise to a spontaneous attempt to attain Him. A Tattvik Shraddha Unreal faith is that which is based on an erroneous conception of Bhagavan, which arises in an impure heart on seeing worldly activities, and which gives rise to self-interested endeavors rooted in pride, prestige, and worldly desires. Some Mahajans have described Tattvik Shraddha as faith in the Shastras, Shastriya Shraddha. It is this Tattvik Shraddha 
that is the cause of eligibility for bhakti. Chudamani Let us admit that some people have developed faith in the Shastras, although their natures are not elevated. Are such people also eligible for bhakti? Vaishnav Das Shraddha is the only cause of eligibility for bhakti. Nature is the cause of eligibility for karma, but not for bhakti. This is clearly stated in the following shlokas from Srimad Bhagavatam, 11, 20, 27 through 28. Jata shraddho mat katasu, nirvina sarva karmasu, veda du kat makan kaman, paritya jay pyanishvaraha. Tato ba jeta mam pritya, shrada lur drita nishchaya. Jusamanas chatan kaman, dukodar kams chagar hayan. A sadhak who has developed faith in narrations about me, and who is disgusted with all kinds of fruit of activity, may still be unable to give up material enjoyment and the desire for such enjoyment. He should understand in his heart that such so-called pleasures are actually sources of misery and condemn himself while attempting to enjoy them. Thereafter, in due course of time, he may be able to worship me with love, faith and fixed determination. Proktena bhakti yogena bhajato ma sakrin mune kama hridaya nashyanti sarve mai hridistite vidyate hridaya grantish Chidyante sarva samshaya, shiyante chasya karmani, mai driste kilatmani. When the sadhak constantly worships me by the method of bhakti yoga that I have described, I come and sit in his heart. As soon as I am established there, all material desires and sanskars on which the material desires are based are destroyed. When the sadhak directly sees me, as Paramatma situated in the hearts of all living entities, the knot of the false ego in his heart is pierced. All of his doubts are cut to pieces, and his desire for fruitive activities are completely nullified. Yat karma bhiya yata pasa, jnana vairagya tascha yat, yogena dana dharmena, shreyo bhir itarerapi, saravan mad bhakti yogena, Mad bhakto labatenjasa, svaga pavagam maddharma, katan chid yadi vanchati. Shrimad Bhagavatam 11.20.32-33 Through the power of bhakti yoga, my bhaktas easily obtain whatever results are obtained with great difficulty through fruitive activities, austerity, knowledge, renunciation, practice of yoga, charity, religious duties, and all other auspicious types of sadhan. My bhaktas are free from all ambition, but they could easily be promoted to the celestial planets, or attain liberation, or residence in Vaikuntha, if they at all desired such things. This is the systematic development of bhakti yoga that arises from Shraddha. Chudamani, what if I don't accept the authority of Srimad Bhagavatam? Vaishnav Das this is the conclusion of all the Shastras. If you don't accept the Bhagavatam, you will be troubled by other Shastras. There is no need for me to quote many different Shastras. You may simply consider what is said in Bhagavad Gita, which is accepted by the adherents of all philosophical systems. In fact, all instructions are present in the Gita Shloka that you uttered when you first arrived here. Gita 9.30 Apichet Sudharacharo Bajate mam ananya bak, sadur eva samanta vya, samyag vya va sito hisa. When one has no object of devotion other than me, and his faith is thus exclusively fixed in me, he remains absorbed in worshipping me by hearing Harikata and chanting Harinam. Such a person has adopted the path of sadhus and should therefore be considered a sadhu even if he behaves in opposition to the path of karma due to an abominable and depraved nature. The purport is that the system of Varnashram that belongs to Karma Kanda is one type of path. The process of knowledge and renunciation that belongs to Gyan Kanda is a second type of path. 
and faith in Harikata and Harinam that develops in Satsanga is a third type of path. Sometimes these three paths are taken together as a single yoga system, identified either as Karma Yoga, Gyan Yoga or Bhakti Yoga, and sometimes they are practiced as separate systems. The practitioners of these different systems are known as Karma Yogis, Gyan Yogis and Bhakti Yogis. Amongst all of these, the Bhakti Yogis are the best, because Bhakti Yoga is endowed with unlimited auspiciousness and is unparalleled in its supremacy. This conclusion is supported in the statement of Gita 6.47. Yogi nam api sarvesham madgate nan taratmana shradavan bhajate yomam same yukta tamomataha. O Arjuna, of all yogis, I consider the topmost yogi to be one who constantly worships me with great faith, with his mind deeply absorbed in loving attachment to me. The Gita 9.31-32 through 32 further explains, Shipram bhavati dharmatma sa svachchantim nigachati konteya pratijanihi name bhakta pranasyati Mamhi parta vyapashritya ye pisyu papayonaya striyo vaishyas tata sudras te piyanti paramgatim. It is essential that you clearly understand the purport of the shloka, Shipram Bhavati Dharmatma. Faithful people who have adopted the path of exclusive devotion are quickly purified of all faults in their nature and behavior. Dharma surely follows wherever there is bhakti, because Bhagavan is the root of all dharma, and he is easily conquered by bhakti. As soon as Bhagavan is established in the heart, maya, who binds the jivas in illusion, is immediately dissipated. There is no need of any other method of sadhan. Dharma appears as soon as one becomes a bhakta and makes a bhakta's heart virtuous. The moment one's desires for mundane sense enjoyment have dissipated, Peace pervades the heart. That is why Sri Krishna promises, My bhakta will never perish. The kamis and jnanis may fall prey to bad association in the course of practicing their sadhan because they are independent, but the bhaktas do not fall down because the influence of Sri Hari's presence saves them from bad association. The bhakta has the supreme destination in his grasp, whether he takes birth in a sinful family or in the home of a brahmana. Chudamani The provision found in our shastras for determining caste by birth seems to me to be superior. One who has taken birth in a brahmana family comes to the platform of knowledge by regular practice of Sandhya-vandana, and in the end he is destined to obtain liberation. I cannot understand how Shraddha develops. Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam explain that bhakti arises from Shraddha, but I would like to know clearly what the jiva should do to attain this Shraddha. Vaishnav Das Shraddha is the jiva's nitya svabhav, eternal nature, but faith in the performance of varnashram duties does not arise from this eternal nature. Rather it arises from naimitika svabhav, the circumstantial or temporary nature. It is said in the Chandogya Upanishad, 7.19.1. Sanat Kumar said, When a person develops Shraddha, he can think about a subject and understand it, whereas one cannot do so without Shraddha. Indeed, only a person who has Shraddha can reflect upon anything. Therefore you must inquire very specifically about Shraddha. Narad said, O Master, I particularly wish to know about this Shraddha. Some people who are learned in the conclusions of the Shastras have explained that the word Shraddha means to have faith in the Vedas and in the words of Sri Guru. This meaning is not wrong, but it is not entirely clear. In our Sampradaya, the meaning of the word Shraddha is given as follows. Shraddha-tvanyo varjam Bhaktyon Mukhi Chitavriti Vishesa. Shraddha is the characteristic function of the heart that strives towards bhakti alone, which is totally devoid of karma and jnana, and which desires nothing other than the exclusive pleasure of Krishna. 
when the sadhak regularly hears the instructions of sadhus in the association of Shuddha-bhaktas, a conviction arises in his heart that he cannot obtain his eternal welfare by the methods of karma, jnana, yoga and so on, and that he has no means of success unless he takes exclusive shelter at the lotus feet of Sri Hari. When this conviction appears, it may be understood that Shraddha has arisen in the sadhak's heart. The nature of Shraddha is described as follows. Sacha Sharanapati Lakshana Shraddha is characterized as an external symptom of surrender to Sri Hari, Sharanagati. Sharanagati is described in these words. Anakulyasya Sankalpa Pratikulyasya Varjanam Rakshisya Titi Vishvasyo Gopritve Varanam Tata Atmanikshkepa Karpanye Sadvida Sharanagatihi Hari Bhakti Vilas 11.6.76 There are six symptoms of self-surrender. The first two are Anakulyasya Sankalpa and Pratikulyasya Varjanam. I will only do that which is favorable for unalloyed bhakti, and I will reject all that is unfavorable. This is called sankalpa, or pratigya, a solemn vow. The third symptom is faith in Bhagavan as one's protector, rakshisyatiti vishvasyo. Bhagavan is my only protector. I can derive absolutely no benefit from jnana, yoga, and other such practices. This is an expression of trust, Vishvasa. The fourth symptom is the deliberate acceptance of Bhagavan as one's maintainer, Goptritve Varanam. I cannot obtain anything or even maintain myself by my own endeavor. I will serve Bhagavan as far as I am able, and he will take care of me. This is what is meant by dependence, Nibharata. The fifth symptom is surrender, Atma Nikshkepa. Who am I? I am His. My duty is to fulfill His desire. This is submission of the Self, Atma Nivedana. The sixth symptom is meekness, Karpanye. I am wretched, insignificant and materially destitute. This is what is meant by humility, Karpanya or Dainya. When these moods become established in the heart, a disposition arises that is called Shraddha, a jiva who has this shraddha is eligible for bhakti, and this is the first stage in the development of the svabhav, like that of those pure jivas who are eternally liberated. Therefore this is the nitya svabhav of the jivas, and all other svabhavs are naimitika. Chudamani I understand, but you still have not explained what shraddha is. If shraddha develops from sat karma, virtuous deeds, then my argument is still stronger, because Shraddha cannot arise without properly performing the Sat Karma and Svadharma of Varnashram. Muslims do not perform Sat Karma, so how can they be eligible for Bhakti? Vaishnav Das It is a fact that Shraddha arises from Sukriti, pious deeds. It is stated in the Brihan Naradiya Purana, 433. Bhaktis tu Bhagavad Bhakta Sangena Parijayate Satsanga Prapyate Pumbi Sukritai Purvasanchitahai The inclination for bhakti is awakened by association with Bhagavan's bhaktas. The jiva obtains the association of Shuddha bhaktas by the accumulated effect of spiritually pious activities performed over many lifetimes. There are two types of Sukriti, Nitya and Naimitika. Nitya Sukriti bears eternal fruit and it results in Sadhu Sangha and Bhakti. Naimitika Sukriti, otherwise known as a Nitya or impermanent Sukriti, bears temporary results that depend on some cause and it leads to material enjoyment and impersonal liberation. All types of material enjoyment are non-eternal because they clearly depend on some cause. Many people think that mukti is eternal, but this is only because they do not know the actual nature of mukti. The individual atma, soul, is shuddha, pure, nitya, eternal, 
and Sanatan, primeval. The cause, Nimitta, of the Jivatma's bondage is association with Maya, and Mukti is the complete dissolution of this bondage. The act of deliverance or release from bondage is accomplished in a single moment, so the act of release is not in itself an eternal action. All consideration of mukti ends as soon as emancipation is attained. So mukti is nothing more than the destruction of a material cause. Therefore, since mukti is only the negation of a temporary material cause, it is also naimitika, causal and temporary. On the other hand, attachment, rati for the feet of Sri Hari, never ends once it is established in the heart of the jiva. Therefore, this rati or bhakti is nitya dharma, and if we analyze its practices, angas correctly, none of them can be said to be naimitika. The type of bhakti that terminates at the point that it bestows mukti is only a type of naimitika karma, while bhakti that is present before, during and after mukti is a distinct and eternal truth and it is the nitya dharma of the jivas. Mukti is but an irrelevant secondary result of bhakti. It is said in the Mundaka Upanishad 1.2.12 Parikshyalokan karmachitan brahmano nirveda mayan nascya krita kritena tadvigyana tam sagurum eva bigachet samit panishrotiyam brahmanishtam a Brahmana who has exhaustively studied the Shastras will become disinterested in the performance of karma by carefully examining the temporary, impure and miserable nature of Swagaloka and other celestial planets which are attainable by performing material pious deeds. This is so because the Nityavastu, Bhagavan, is eternal reality and is beyond the reach of karma. To gain factual knowledge and realization of that eternal supreme person, one should find a qualified guru who is learned in the Vedas, who is firmly established in the service of Bhagavan, and who knows the absolute truth. One should then approach that guru carrying wood for kindling a sacrificial fire, and should surrender body, mind and words to him with faith and humility. Karma, Yoga and Gyan all produce Naimitika Sukriti, whereas the association of bhaktas, bhakta sangha, and contact with acts of devotion, bhakti kriya sangha, produce nitya sukriti. Only one who has accumulated nitya sukriti over many lifetimes will develop shraddha. Naimitika sukriti produces many different results, but it will not lead to the development of faith in unalloyed bhakti. Chudamani, please explain clearly what you mean by Bhakta Sangha and Bhakti Kriya Sangha? From what type of Sukriti do these arise? Vaishnav Das Bhakta Sangha means conversing with Shuddha Bhaktas, serving them and hearing their discourses. Shuddha Bhaktas perform the activities of Bhakti such as public congregational chanting of Sri Nam. Participation in these activities or performing them on one's own is called Bhakti Kriya Sangha contact with acts of devotion. The Shastras explain that Bhakti Kriya consists of activities such as cleansing the temple of Sri Hari, offering a lamp to Tulsi and observing Hari Vasara, Ekadashi, Janmastami, Ram Nomi and other such days. Such activities create Sukriti that nourishes devotion, even if one performs them accidentally or without pure Shraddha. When this Sukriti acquires strength after many lifetimes, Shraddha for Sadhu Sangha and exclusive devotion, Ananya Bhakti develops. It must be acknowledged that every Vastu, substance, has some particular potency, and this is known as the inherent potency of that substance. The potency to nourish Bhakti is found only within the activities of Bhakti. These activities produce Sukriti even if they are performed indifferently, what to speak when they are being performed with faith. This is expressed in the Prabhash Kanda, quoted in Hari Bhakti Vilas 11.451. Madhura Maduram Etan Mangalam Mangalanam 
Sakala nigamavali sat palam chitsvarupam. Sakridapi parijitam shradaya helayava. Briguvara nara matram tariyat krishna nama. Shri Krishna Nam is the sweetest among all things that are sweet, and it stands supreme among all that is auspicious. It is the eternal, fully ripened spiritual fruit of the wish-fulfilling tree of the Vedas. O best of the Brigus, Shri Krishna Nam awards immediate deliverance from the ocean of material existence to anyone who offenselessly chants even once, either with faith or without faith. Thus, all types of Sukriti that nourish Bhakti are Nitya Sukriti. When this Sukriti becomes strong, one gradually develops Shraddha in Ananya Bhakti, unalloyed Bhakti, and one attains Sadhu Sangha. Birth in a Muslim family is the result of Naimitika Duskriti, temporary impious deeds, whereas faith in Ananya Bhakti is the result of Nitya Sukriti, eternal pious deeds. What is surprising about this? Chudamani this is what I meant by my previous question. If there is such a thing as Bhakti Poshaka Sukriti, Sukriti that nourishes devotion, it must arise from some other type of Sukriti. But Muslims do not have any other type of Sukriti, so it is not possible for them to have Bhakti Poshaka Sukriti either. Vaishnav Das This is not a fact. Nitya Sukriti and Naimitika Sukriti are classified separately so they do not depend upon one another. Once there was a sinful hunter who was full of impious deeds, but who chanced to stay up all night and fast on Shivratri. Because of the Nitya Sukriti he accrued from this, he developed eligibility for Hari Bhakti. It is said in the Srimad Bhagavatam 12, 13, 16, Vaishnavam Yatar Shambhu. Among Vaishnavas, Shivji is the best. From this statement, it is understood that Mahadev is the most worshipable Vaishnava, and one obtains Hari Bhakti by observing a vow to please him. Chudamani So do you mean to say that Nitya Sukriti comes about by chance? Vaishnava Das Everything comes about by chance. This is also the case on the path of karma. What is the circumstance by which the jiva first entered the cycle of karma? Can it be anything other than a chance occurrence? The Mimamsa philosophers have described karma as anadi, being without beginning, but actually karma does have a root. The chance occurrence that brings one's original karma into effect is indifference to Bhagavan, Bhagavan Vimukata. Similarly, Nitya Sukriti also seems to be a chance occurrence. It is said in the Shvetashvatara Upanishad, 4, 7. The jiva and the indwelling paramatma both reside in the same tree, namely the material body. The jiva is attached to material sense enjoyment and is therefore sunk in the bodily conception of life. Bewildered by maya, he cannot find any means of deliverance, and thus he laments. However, by the influence of Sukriti acquired over many lifetimes, he can obtain the mercy of Ishwara or his Shuddha Bhaktas. At that time, he will see in his heart that there is a second individual within the tree of his body. This is Ishwara, who is served eternally by his unalloyed Bhaktas. When the Jiva witnesses the uncommon glories of Sri Krishna, he becomes free from all lamentation. It is said in the Srimad Bhagavatam 10.51.53, Bhava Pava Go Brahmato Yada Bhavej Janasya Tarya Chuta Sat Samagrama Sat Sangamo Yarhi Tadaiva Sat Gato Paravareshe Tvai Jayate Rati O Sri Achuta, you are eternally situated in your original spiritual form. The Jiva has been wandering in the cycle of birth and death since time without beginning. When the time for his release from this cycle approaches, he obtains satsanga, and through this he becomes firmly attached to you, who are the supreme goal of attainment for the sadhus and the controller of both spirit and matter. And 3.25.25 Satam prasangan mama virya samvido bhavanti hritkarna rasayana kata 
Taj Jo Sanad Asvapavarga Vartmani, Shraddha Ratir Bhaktir Anu Kramishyati. As a result of full-hearted association with Shuddha Bhaktas, one gets the opportunity to hear descriptions of my heroic deeds, which are like a nectarian tonic for the ears and the heart. By repeatedly relishing those topics through hearing and contemplation, one quickly and successfully attains Shraddha, Rati and Prem Bhakti towards me. Judamani, in your opinion, is there no difference between an Aryan and a Yavana? Vaishnav Das, there are two kinds of differences, those that relate to the Absolute Reality, Paramatika, and those that relate to practical experience, Vyavaharik. There is no absolute difference between the Aryans and Yavanas, but there is a practical difference. Chudamani, why do you insist on repeatedly showing off your verbosity? What do you mean by a practical difference between Aryans and Yavanas? Vaishnavdas, the term practical, Vyavaharik, refers to worldly customs. In domestic life, Yavanas are considered untouchable, so their association is unsuitable from the practical point of view. Aryans should not touch water and food that has been touched by a Yavana. The body of a Yavana is insignificant and untouchable because of his unfortunate birth. Chudamani, then how can there possibly be no difference between Aryans and Yavanas from the absolute point of view? Please explain this clearly. Vaishnavdas, the Shastras have affirmed this lucidly. Brigu vara nara matram, tarayat Krishna nam. O best of the Brigus, Shri Krishna nam delivers all men. According to this shloka, Yavadas and all other human beings have an equal opportunity to attain the supreme goal of life. Those who are devoid of Nitya Sukriti are known as two legged animals, Dvipada Pashu, because they have no faith in Krishna Nam. Such people have no human qualities, even though they have attained a human birth. It is said in the Mahabharat Maha Prasade Govinde Nama Brahmani Vaishnave Svalpa Punya Vatam Rajan Vishvaso Naivajayate. O King, one whose past pious deeds are very meagre, cannot have faith in Mahaprasad, in Sri Govinda, in Sri Krishna Nam, or in the Vaishnavas. Nitya Sukriti is great Sukriti that purifies the Jiva. Naimitika Sukriti is insignificant Sukriti that does not have the power to awaken Shraddha towards transcendental objects. In this material world, there are four transcendental objects that awaken spiritual consciousness Mahaprasad, Govinda, Govinda Nam, and Shuddha Vaishnavas. Chudamani, what kind of strange idea is this? This is simply the fanaticism of the Vaishnavas. How can rice, dal, and vegetables be spiritual? Chinmaya. You Vaishnavas are capable of anything. Vaishnavdas, whatever you do, Please do not criticize the Vaishnavas. This is my humble request. In a debate, one should argue the points in question. What is the use of deriding the Vaishnavas? Mahaprasad provokes spiritual consciousness and dissolves one's materialistic nature. So it is the only food that is acceptable in this material world. Therefore, Sri Isapanishad 1 says, Ishavasyam idam saravam Yat kincha jagat yam jagat, tiena tiena bunjita, magrida kasyas viddanam. Everything animate and inanimate within the universe is situated in Ishwara, and is also pervaded by him. Therefore, in a detached mood, one should accept only what is necessary for one's maintenance, considering all things to be the remnants of Ishwara. One should not be attached to another's wealth considering himself to be the enjoyer. Whatever exists within the universe is connected to Sri Hari's potency. One will give up the worldly-minded spirit of enjoyment if he considers everything to be related to Sri Hari's spiritual potency. An introspective jiva will not be degraded if he accepts only those worldly things that are necessary for the maintenance of his body, considering them to be the remnants of Sri Hari. On the contrary, 
his inclination towards spiritual consciousness will be aroused. The remnants of food and other articles offered to Bhagavan are known as Mahaprasad. It is a great misfortune that you have no faith in such merciful dealings of the Lord. Chudamani, let us drop this subject and return to the original point of our discussion. What is the proper behavior between the Yavanas and you people? Vaishnavdas, as long as someone remains a Yavana, we remain indifferent to him. However, when someone who was formerly a Yavana becomes a Vaishnava by the influence of Nitya Sukriti, we no longer consider him a Yavana. This is very clear in the following statement from the Padma Purana. Shudram va Bhagavad Bhaktam Nisha Dang Svapachangtata Vikshate Jatisa Manyat Sayati Narakam Druvam If one considers a devotee of Bhagavan to be a member of the lowest of the four castes, Shudra, a member of an aboriginal tribe of hunters, Nishada, or an outcast dog eater, Swapacha, merely because the devotee has taken birth in such families, one is assuredly destined for hell. The Itihas Samuchaya also says, Name Priyas Chatur Vedi, Mad Bhakta Svapacha Priya, Tasmai Deyam Tato Grayam, Sacha Pujyo Yatahyayam. Quoted in Hari Bhakti Vilas 10.127. A Brahmana who has studied the four Vedas, but has no bhakti, is not dear to me, whereas my bhakta is very dear to me, even if he has taken birth in a family of dog-eaters. Such a bhakta is fit to receive charity, and whatever he offers should be accepted. Indeed, he is as worshipable as I am. Chudamani, I understand. Then can a Grihasta Vaishnava make a marriage relationship with a Yavana family? Vaishnavdas. From the general point of view, a Yavana remains a Yavana in the eyes of the general populace until he relinquishes his body. But from the absolute point of view, he is no longer regarded as a Yavana once he attains bhakti. Marriage is one of the ten kinds of social rights, smartakama. If a Grihasta Vaishnava is an Aryan, that is, if he is included within the four Varnas, he should only marry within his own varna. Even though the religious duties associated with the four castes are naimitika in nature, they are still recommended for the maintenance of domestic life. One cannot become a Vaishnava simply by giving up the social customs of the four varnas. Vaishnavas should accept whatever is favorable for bhakti, and one can only give up the duties of the varnas when he has become qualified to do so by genuine detachment. Then one can give up the duties of the four varnas and everything associated with them. Varna dharma can be given up easily when it becomes unfavorable to bhajan. Similarly, a yavana who has awakened faith in bhakti has the right to give up the association of the yavana community if it becomes unfavorable for bhajan. Suppose that one Vaishnava is an Aryan who is qualified to give up the four varnas and another Vaishnava is a Yavana who is qualified to give up his community. Then what is the difference between them? Both of them have given up ordinary life, Vyavaha, and have become brothers in regard to spiritual reality, Paramata. However, this principle of rejecting Varna Dharma does not apply to a Grihasta Vaishnava. A Grihasta Vaishnava should not give up domestic society until he is fully qualified to do so, even if it is unfavorable to bhajan. However, he can easily give up worldly society when firm attachment and affection for that which is favorable to bhajan awakens in his heart. It is said in the Srimad Bhagavatam 11.11.32 Agya yaivam gunan doshan maya dishtan apisvakan dharaman santya jaya saravan Mam bajet sa tu satamaha. Sri Krishna says, In the Vedas I have given duties to human beings, explaining what are positive attributes and what are faults. One is considered the best of sadhus if he knows all this, but abandons his duties to worship me exclusively 
with the firm conviction that all perfection may be attained by bhakti alone. This is corroborated by the ultimate conclusion of the Bhagavad Gita, 1866. Sarva dharmam parityaja, mam ekam sharanam braja, aham tvam sarva papai bio, moksha isyami ma suchaha. Abandon all varieties of naimitika dharma, such as karma and jnana, and surrender only unto me. Do not lament, for I will deliver you from all sinful reactions incurred by giving up your prescribed duties. This is supported further in Srimad Bhagavatam 4.29.46. Yada yasya nugri nati bhagavan atma bhavitaha sajahati matim loke vede cha parinishtitam Bhagavan bestows his mercy upon a jiva with whom he is pleased because of his self-surrender or serving him with complete absorption of his inner faculties. At that time, the jiva gives up attachment for all social customs and religious rituals prescribed by the Vedas. Chudamani, can you eat food, drink water, and conduct other such activities with a Yavana who has truly become a Vaishnava? Vaishnava Das A renounced Vaishnava, who is indifferent to all social restrictions, is known as Nirapeksha, without any needs or requirements, and he can honor Mahaprasad with such a Vaishnava. A Grihasta Vaishnava cannot sit and eat with him in the context of ordinary social or family dealings, but there is no such objection when it comes to honoring Vishnu or Vaishnava Prasad. In fact, it is his duty. Chudamani. Then why is it that Yavana Vaishnavas are not permitted to worship and serve the deities in the Vaishnava temples? Vaishnava Das. It is an offense to refer to a Vaishnava as a Yavana simply because he has taken birth in such a family. All Vaishnavas have the right to serve Krishna. If a Grihasta Vaishnava serves the deity in a way that breaks the rules of Varnashram, it is considered to be a fault from the worldly point of view. Nirapeksh Vaishnavas are not required to worship the deity because that would hinder their quality of being free from all external requirements and dependencies. Nirapekshata. They remain engaged in serving Sri Radha Balaba through service carried out by the internally conceived spiritual form, Manasi Seva. Chudamani. I understand. Now please tell me what you think about the Brahmanas. Vaishnav Das. There are two types of Brahmanas, Brahmanas by nature, Swabhav Siddha, and Brahmanas by birth alone, Jati Siddha. Those who are Brahmanas by nature should be respected by adherents of all philosophical systems because they are practically Vaishnavas. And those who are only Brahmanas by birth are given conventional respect by everyone, and this is also approved by the Vaishnavas. The conclusion of the Shastra on this topic is expressed in Srimad Bhagavatam 7.9.10. A Bhakta who is born in a family of dog-eaters, but who has dedicated his mind, words, activities and wealth at the lotus feet of Krishna, is superior to a Brahmana who has all twelve Brahminical qualities, but who is averse to the lotus feet of Sri Hari, whose navel is shaped like a lotus. Such a Bhakta can purify himself and his whole family whereas the Brahmana, who is puffed up with false prestige, cannot even purify himself. That is my opinion. Chudamani Shudras are not eligible to study the Vedas. So can a Shudra study the Vedas when he becomes a Vaishnava? Vaishnava Das From the absolute point of view, when one becomes a pure Vaishnava, he automatically attains the status of a Brahmana whatever caste he may belong to. The Vedas are divided into two sections, instructions regarding the performance of karma, prescribed duties, and instructions regarding tattva, the absolute truth. Those who are qualified as brahmanas in a worldly sense are eligible to study the Vedas that promote karma, and those who are brahmanas by spiritual qualification are qualified to study the Vedas that promote tattva, Pure Vaishnavas can study and teach the Vedas that promote spiritual truth, no matter what caste they are born into. 
and it is practically observed that they do so. It is said in the Brihad Aranyaka Upanishad, 4.4.21, Tameva diro vignana, pragyam kurvita brahmanaha. A brahmana is a sober and spiritually enlightened person who clearly knows Parabrahma and serves him through Prema Bhakti, which is a manifestation of the highest knowledge. It is also said in the Brihad Aranyaka Upanishad, 3.8.10, Yova etad aksharam, gargavidi tvasmalokat, praiti sakripanaha, ataya etad aksharam, gargividi tvasmalokat, praiti sabramanaha. O Gargi, he who quits this world without knowing the supreme imperishable being, Sri Vishnu, is a wretched miser, whereas he who quits this world, knowing the Supreme Being, is recognized as a Brahmana. Manu has said the following in regard to those who are Brahmanas by Vyavaharik or social considerations. Yo Naditya Dvijo Vedam Anyatra Kurute Shramam Sajivan Eva Shudra Tvam Ashu Gachati Sanvayaha a Brahmana, Chatriya or Vaisha becomes twice born by investiture with the sacred thread and this prepares him for studying the Vedas. If a Dvija fails to study the Vedas after receiving the sacred thread and instead studies other subjects such as economics, science or logic, he and his family members quickly become degraded in this very life to the status of Shudras. Shvetas Vatara Upanishad 623 explains the eligibility to study the Vedas that promote spiritual truth. Yasya deve para bhaktir, yata deve tata gorau, tasyaite katitahyata, prakashante mahatmanaha. All the confidential truths described in this Upanishad will be revealed to that great soul who has the same exclusive, uninterrupted, transcendental devotion, parabhakti, for his guru, that he has for Sri Bhagavan. The word Parabhakti in the above shloka means Shuddha Bhakti, pure Bhakti. I don't want to elaborate any further on this topic. You should try to understand it yourself. In short, those who have faith in Ananya Bhakti are eligible to study the Vedas that promote spiritual truth, tattva, and those who have already attained Ananya Bhakti are eligible to teach those Vedas. Chirumani. Then do you people conclude that the Vedas that promote tattva teach only Vaishnava Dharma and no other religion? Vaishnavdas. Dharma is one, not two, and it is also known as Nitya Dharma or Vaishnav Dharma. All other forms of Naimitika Dharma taught in the Vedas are simply steps leading to that eternal religion. Sri Krishna has said, Kalena nasta pralaye, vani yam veda sangita, maya dao brahmane prokta, dharamo yasyam madat makaha. Shumad Bhagavatam 11.14.3 The Vedas contain instructions on Bhagavat Dharma. At the time of annihilation, that message was lost by the influence of time. Then at the beginning of the next creation, known as Brahma Kalpa, I again spoke the same Vedic message to Brahmaji. The Kata Upanishad 139 states, Sarva Veda yat padam amananti, tat te padam sangrehina bravimi, tat Vishnu paramam padam sada. I shall now describe to you in brief that ultimate truth that all the Vedas have repeatedly described as the supreme object of attainment. That abode of Vishnu, the all-pervading Paramatma Vasudev, is the only supreme destination. There are also many other evidences from Shastra. By this point in the discussion, the faces of Devi Vidyaratna and his associates looked pale and withered, and the teacher's enthusiasm was shattered. It was nearly five o'clock in the afternoon, so everyone agreed to adjourn the day's discussion, and the meeting ended. The Brahmana Pandits departed, enthusiastically praising the scholarship of Vaishnavdas, and the Vaishnavas left for their respective places, loudly chanting the names of Hari.
Thus ends the sixth chapter of Jiva Dharma entitled Nitya Dharma, Race and Caste.